Last year, Rebel Audio debuted its first and so far only headphone amplifier. Rebel calls it the Rebel Amp. It's a name that gets straight to the point. This is a $500 handmade amplifier. It was received with overwhelming positive reviews from all corners of the hype machine. Today, we take a look at the Rebel Amp. Is this an unmitigated success or yet another hyped product? Rebel Audio is located in Ukraine. It is, as far as I know, a one-man operation. In other words, every amplifier is made by hand by one person. The Rebel Amp delivers Class A amplification. Rebel Audio says that their amp uses top-of-the-line components, the type found in more expensive gear. Rebel Audio insists that their amp is built so that it has low distortion. One feature they highlight is that the amp will not make a popping noise when being turned on or off. The amp has only RCA input and output. There is no balance connection option. The amplifier has a single quarter-inch headphone output. On the front is also a very large volume knob. This knob will control volume when the amp is used with powered speakers. The front housing has two toggle switches. One is to select between headphone and preamp out. The other allows you to select between low, medium, and high gain. There is also a single LED which activates only when the amplifier is turned on. On the back, there are the RCA inputs and outputs and a power switch. The entire amp is built of metal. It is heavy and sturdy. I cannot find a single fault, unaligned edge, scratch, dent, or wobbly part on this product. The amp has vent holes on the top. All of those openings are precisely cut and evenly spaced. The amp comes in two colors, bright green and black. The green color you see on the Rebel Audio website is the color you get. The amp really is as bright as shown in the product photos. There is nothing complicated about the Rebel Amp. It is simplicity at its best. You get exactly what you need and nothing frivolous. In fact, Rebel Audio claims that they purposefully refuse to use an LCD screen, microcontrollers, software, or any other type of typical stuff found in a lot of Chinese amplifiers. In return, you get an amplifier that is sturdy, well-built, and fundamentally basic. And when I say basic, I mean basic. Rebel Audio does not ship an RCA cable. They don't even ship a power cable. That is some next-level cheapness. So you better have an IEC NEMA cable handy when this amplifier arrives, or you simply will not be able to plug it in and use it. No matter how much you like a small brand or a one-man show, not including a power cable is utterly inexcusable. Rebel Audio does not say what the sound signature of this amplifier should be. However, the audiophile community believes it has a warm sound signature. I really would not go that far. I have done a lot of amplifier and DAC reviews. I used to give detailed information about the amplifier's or DAC sound signature from one frequency range to the next. However, I'm no longer going to do that. Frankly, it's a lot of work and few people actually listen to the entire analysis. So I'm just going to tell you my impression of the overall sound signature. And after that, I will do an actual A-B comparison using other amplifiers. This, I think, is the only way to get a more accurate picture of how any device actually performs. I have owned the Rebel Amp for over six months. I am quite comfortable describing its sound performance. However, for this review, I use the same testing methodology I employ for all of my reviews. I paired the Aventone Planar and Allo Audio S4X with the Rebel Amp. The Planar is the most neutral planar magnetic headphone I have ever heard. The S4X is the most neutral dynamic driver headphone I have heard. The Rebel Amp was plugged into my Songcause LAQXD1 DAC. This is a neutral source. I use music over Amazon Music HD. My overall impression is that the Rebel Amp is a neutral amplifier. There might be very slight emphasis in bass and an ever so slight reduction in treble, but I cannot be completely certain. I listened to my test playlist and tried to determine if the Aventone Planar's sub-bass roll-off was different with the Rebel Amp. If this amplifier has a bass boost, the Planar would show it. On the other hand, if the Rebel Amp has a bass roll-off, then the S4X's neutral bass response would be affected. The Planar's sub-bass roll-off remained. The transients was the same as with any other neutral source. Clarity in the bass was not noticeably different from the RME ADI-2 DAC and other neutral amplifiers. On the Allo Audio S4X, the bass appeared to have just slightly greater mid-bass emphasis. This could have been my imagination, but I think there was slightly greater mid-bass impact. There was not a significant deviation from the S4X's typical performance with other neutral sources. The mids appeared to be fairly neutral. 
The S4X has a marginal sibilance emphasis on neutral sources, and its performance on the Rebel Amp was the same. The Aventone Planar, on the other hand, has very neutral presentation of the mids, and that is exactly how it appeared with the Rebel Amp. All instruments sounded neutral and natural, and had accurate timbre. There was no distortion or harshness. The treble is also neutral. Both the S4X and Aventone Planar have neutral treble, and on both headphones, the treble instruments seem to be perfectly recreated, with no difference than what I have heard on other neutral sources. Brass and horns cut through the mix, and retain their nasally signatures. Nothing sounded harsh or peaky. The amp also has a fairly clear presentation. As a counter example, you might want to consider the Quart Mojo and the AudioQuest Dragonfly Red. Both of those sources have a far warmer, less detailed sound signature. The Rebel Amp, however, is as clear as many other neutral amplifiers I've heard, especially those that cost less than it does. I have read user reviews talking about the Rebel Amp having wide soundstage. I am not going to waste time talking about this issue. Amplifiers and DACs have no effect on soundstage, and this fact remains untarnished with the Rebel Amp. So, overall, the Rebel Amp is in all practical terms neutral. It has a slight coloration which may or may not be perceptible with your particular headphones. For example, if you plan to listen with the DT990, your experience will not be magically different from how that headphone performs with other amplifiers. Now, on to comparisons. I decided to compare the Rebel Amp against the $100 Shit Magni Heresy, the $500 Rupert Neve headphone amplifier, and the $150 iFi Zencan. I used a passive AB switch. Each comparison amplifier was connected to this switch against the Rebel Amp. Each amplifier was connected to the Sonkaz LAQXD1 through an RCA splitter. Consequently, all amps got the exact same signal. I used the Allo Audio S4X as my testing headphone. All four amplifiers have plenty of power for this headphone. I was easily able to volume match the amplifiers. Compared against the Heresy, the Rebel Amp seemed to have nearly identical sound signature. There is a very slight alteration in bass. It seemed that the bass was marginally clearer on the Magni. On the Rebel Amp, it appeared to me that the Rebel Amp had a slight sub-bass emphasis, which melded somewhat with the mid-bass. This was not obvious for every track, but it was somewhat noticeable from time to time. The mids were hard to distinguish. All instruments sounded identical. Vocals were equally clear and similarly replicated on both amplifiers. The S4X has a slight sibilance emphasis, and both amplifiers acted exactly the same with the S4X. The S4X retained its sibilance. Trouble was exactly the same between these amps. I listened to Scherzo for X-Wings, which uses brass and horns extensively, and tried to listen for any alteration. There was no difference at all. I listened to numerous orchestral tracks and hunted for any audible difference. On some occasions, it sounded almost as if the Rebel Amp had just a tiny amount less energy with violins and saxophones, but this was not consistent. The next comparison was with the Rupert Neve headphone amp. I had to select medium gain on the Rebel Amp to properly volume match, however, I was able to match volume quite easily. I switched back and forth on the AB switch and listened to my test playlist again. There was no alteration whatsoever in the bass frequency. Both amplifiers sounded identical. Neither had more or less impact or clarity. The mids response was almost identical as well. The only potential difference was the presentation of vocals. The Rebel Amp sometimes made it sound as if vocals were slightly clearer. Repeated A-B comparisons of the same track rendered inconsistent results. Sometimes I thought I heard a difference and sometimes I didn't, all on the same track. Consequently, I will have to chalk up any differences I heard to my imagination. Assuming there is some kind of difference, it is so minute that I cannot consistently hear it. I listened for 20 minutes to Skirtso for X-Wings and switched back and forth countless times. I tried very hard to hear any differences at all. There simply were none. All the instruments sounded identical. There was no alteration with clarity or decay, or anything else for that matter. Saxophones, brass, horns, trombones, cymbals, violins, everything sounded exactly the same on both amplifiers. The final test was with the iFi Zen Can. I set the can to maximum gain and put the Rebel Amp to high gain. I did not use the X-Space and 3D filters on the can. The iFi Zen Can has a noticeably, though not night and day, difference in bass response compared to the Rebel Amp. It appeared that there was a marginal sub-bass accentuation with the can. The Rebel Amp seemed to be ever so slightly clearer. Mid-bass also had a slight boost on the can. However, none of these alterations were shockingly obvious. Instead, they were perceptible only through repeated A-B switching. 
The can also has a very slight difference in mid's response, particularly vocals. It appears that the can has a marginal smoothing effect. Sibilance is just a tiny bit reduced on the can, whereas on the Rebel Amp it was neutral. Moreover, it appeared that the can might be just a little clearer for mid-centric instruments and vocals. I thought I heard multiple vocalists marginally more clearly on the Zen can. This could be attributed to imperfect volume matching. I played around with the volume knobs to get a more precise match, and no matter what I tried, the slight differences remained. Other than that, all mid-centric instruments sounded the same. Treble seemed to be equally energetic on both amplifiers. There were occasions where I thought the Zen can had a slight emphasis, particularly for brass and horns. Indeed, switching back and forth numerous times on the same track, I could tell a slight difference. The Zen can seemed to have sharper emphasis of the brass and horns, but this was not a huge deviation. In fact, the alteration I heard could be attributed to imperfect volume matching, if nothing else. I know some people will simply not accept what I say about the Rebel Amp sound signature. There are those who believe amplifiers should sound different from one another. This can be the case, but it is not the rule. In fact, when an amplifier is neutral, whatever minor deviations you hear could be simply your imagination. This is why I encourage people to buy a passive AB switch and conduct actual comparisons. The other consideration is that if you have an amplifier that does not provide sufficient power to your headphones and you switch to a more powerful amplifier, you will hear a difference. But this difference is not necessarily because a new amplifier has a different sound signature. Rather, it is far more probable that the alteration is caused by the headphone drivers receiving proper amplification. I am fully aware of commentary that the Rebel Amp provides some type of mystical warmth to music. That was not my experience. While I might concede that the Rebel Amp has a very slight lean towards warmth, I cannot say that with a certainty. What I can say is that when compared against the Magni and the RNHP, the Rebel Amp has practically identical sound performance. And when compared against the Zencan, an amplifier that does have a slight warm signature, the Rebel Amp displayed minor differences in sound. Recently, we have seen many Chinese amplifiers with staggering power output numbers, but upon close inspection, we have discovered that the manufacturers have been providing misleading information. SMSL and Topping are notorious for using specialized acts with very high voltage to obtain their amplifiers' power output measurements. I have become quite wary of any company's purported power output for a standalone amplifier. Unless the company specifically indicates what voltage was delivered to the amp, we have to be skeptical of the power output until we get a third-party confirmation. Unfortunately, there are a few issues with the Rebel Amp's claimed power output. First, Rebel Audio claims 1 watt into 32 ohms, and provides no other measurements for higher impedances. Second, they do not state what DAC or voltage was used for the measurement. And finally, I could not find a third-party measurement to verify Rebel Audio's power output claims. I contacted Rebel Audio and asked them for more information. It turns out that Rebel Audio did not use a standard DAC when they measured their amplifier. Rebel Audio used a DIY DAC with 2.5 VRMS. Rebel Audio further stated that their amplifier will provide 150 milliwatts into 300 ohms using the same DIY DAC. I am not aware of any DAC that outputs 2.5 VRMS from RCA. Most affordable DACs provide 2 or 2.1 VRMS through RCA connection. This means that when you connect the Rebel Amp to the Shit Modi or Modius or the Topping E30, for example, they will provide 2 VRMS output. The iFi Zen DAC has a fixed RCA output voltage of 2.1. However, through variable selection, it can provide approximately 3 VRMS. The Chord Q-Test has similar functionality. So, while it is possible to find DACs that are higher than 2 VRMS through RCA, it is not a common feature. The bottom line is that if you do not already have a DAC that has higher voltage, then you will need to get one in order to get the 1 watt at 32 ohm number. The practical effect on the Rebel Amp is that, when paired with a typical DAC, you will not achieve 1 watt into 32 ohms, nor will you get 150 milliwatts into 300 ohms. Assuming your DAC has a maximum output voltage of 2 VRMS, the Rebel Amp's maximum power delivery will be less than what Rebel Audio measured with their 2.5 VRMS DAC. Of course, if you pair a DAC with higher voltage, then you will exceed Rebel Audio's purported 1 watt. 
What I think is somewhat troubling is the steep decline in power output from 32 ohms to 300 ohms. The $100 shit Magni, for example, has over 400 milliwatts at 300 ohms compared to the Rebel Ramp's 150 milliwatts at 300 ohms. Of course, someone might point out that the Rebel Amp is Class A, and therefore does not necessarily need high power output numbers with higher impedances. Class A amps, in the most simple terms, provide all the power they can from the moment they are turned on. They draw full power from the power supply, whether the volume knob is at mute or maximum. Class B or AB amps alternate power draw. It's not a consistent maximum as in the case with Class A. In practical terms, this means that a Class A amplifier should provide sufficient power to your given headphones earlier than Class B or Class AB. We can put this to an unscientific test. We can compare the Rebel Amp against the Shit Magni Heresy. The Magni is a Class AB amp. We can use the 600 ohm Bear Dynamic T1 2nd Gen and the 50 ohm Mod House Argon. The T1 does not require ridiculous levels of power, but the Argon, as with all T50RP mods, does. The Argon demands a minimum of 1 watt into 50 ohms. We paired the Rebel Amp and Magni to the Sonkaz LAQXD1, a DAC with a standard 2 VRMS output. Both amplifiers were switched to high gain and then connected to a passive AB switch, which was connected to the headphones. The goal was to determine when the headphones achieved the same volume on both amps. The secondary goal is to determine if one amplifier provides a noticeably different sound performance at lower volumes or higher volumes. If the Class A circuitry does in fact provide an advantage to AB circuitry, then theoretically we should be able to hear it. Both the Magni and Rebel Amp easily powered the T1. It would be too much speculation to assume that the volume pots for the amplifiers are similarly tuned. So let's just say this. The Rebel Amp provides sufficient power for the T1 a little sooner on the volume dial than on the Magni. In practical terms, however, both the Magni and Rebel Amp have plenty of power to blow your drivers and your eardrums. The Argon had a different result. It was clear that the Argon got proper amplification on the Magni for the drivers to work at peak performance. The Rebel Amp, however, was not quite able to match the Magni. Both amplifiers got the Argon loud. I was able to volume match but the bass response and clarity was not the same. In fact, the Argon had tighter, more impactful slam on the Magni. It was not a night and day difference, but it was easily perceptible with the passive switch. As I stated before, this was not a scientific test. Think of it more as a demonstration. Hopefully, you get an idea of the type of differences you're supposed to experience between Class A and Class AB. Regardless, it is safe to say that the Rebel Amp will provide sufficient power for most headphones. Planar Magnetic and Dynamic Driver headphones will pair just fine with this amp. The only caveat will be the Fostex T50RP mods, which are by nature very power hungry. The Rebel Amp exhibited no audible noise or distortion during my tests. I'm always hesitant to do business with a young company, especially when that company is operated by only one individual. It is imperative we understand the policies that Rebel Audio uses. Two issues I want to highlight are the warranty and returns. I reviewed Rebel Audio's website for information about these topics. I also emailed back and forth with Rebel Audio for additional clarification. Rebel Audio provides a two-year warranty for their amp. If you buy it directly from Rebel Audio, you get that warranty. If you buy the amp secondhand, no warranty for you. Rebel Audio also permits returns within 15 days of receiving the amplifier. In other words, the day the amp is delivered to your door, the clock starts ticking. If you do not want the amp, you have 15 days after delivery to request a return. This sounds good on paper, but there's more to it than that. Even though the warranty is two years, there is a difference between the coverage you get in the first year compared to the second year. Rebel Audio says that the first year repair guarantee covers all defects with the product as long as the defects are not caused by the user. You are responsible for shipping the amplifier back to Rebel Audio, which, by the way, is in Ukraine. You must use the original shipping box. Once Rebel Audio gets the amplifier back, they will determine if the defect is the fault of the user. If the user is not at fault, then Rebel Audio says they will reimburse the cost of shipping to the user. However, there is an additional caveat. 
Rebel Audio says that they will cover the shipping cost only up to the cost of shipping they incurred when they originally shipped the amplifier to you. Let me give you an example. Let's say you bought the Rebel Amp from Rebel Audio. Rebel Audio ships the amp to you in the United States. You want to get a first-year warranty repair. You therefore send the amplifier back to Ukraine. Assume that the shipping cost back to Ukraine was about $100 for you. If Rebel Audio originally shipped the amplifier to you for $50, then you only get a $50 refund on shipping if your warranty applies. Once Rebel Audio repairs the amplifier, they say they will ship it back to you at no cost. The second year warranty is slightly different. The same rules about shipping in the original box and non-user fault still apply. However, in the second year, you will be responsible for shipping both ways. Then there's the additional problem of user-induced faults. If Rebel Audio concludes that the defect to the amplifier was caused by the user, then you will be responsible for shipping both ways and for parts that need repairing. This, as you might imagine, could be very costly. Let's quickly talk about the return policy. You are allowed to request a return within 15 days of delivery. You will be responsible for the shipping back to Ukraine. You will not get a refund for this shipping. And on top of that, you will be charged a 15% restocking fee. An example I think is warranted. Let's assume that your total cost for the amplifier is $500, not including import fees. You ask for and are granted a request to return the amplifier within 15 days. Let us assume that you live in the United States and you discover that shipping the amplifier to Ukraine will cost you $100. Once Rebel Audio gets the amplifier back, they keep 15% of the original price. So, you paid $500 for the amp originally. 15% of $500 is $75. This means your refund will be $425. From that $425, subtract the $100 you had to pay for return shipping. The money you actually get back is $325. In other words, with this example, you just spent $175 to rent an amplifier for 15 days. That's hard to swallow. I bring all of this up because it is a huge concern for those who live outside of Europe. Shipping costs will vary, but considering the size and weight of the Rebel Amp, you will likely end up spending around $100 for shipping to Ukraine if you live outside of Europe. Rebel Audio's warranty policy is unnecessarily complicated. I think it is a little odd to force a customer to pay for shipping costs in the second year of warranty. This is essentially punishment for requesting warranty service, even when the fault in the amplifier is not user-induced. It is also concerning that Rebel Audio limits the shipping refund in the first year of warranty. Conceivably, Rebel Audio might have a favorable shipping service or a shipping account that gives them a discount. You likely do not have this luxury. Of course, if the amplifier is well made, then you should not have to worry about any of this. But as with all electronic devices, problems do arise and defects do occur. Be mindful of Rebel Audio's policies before you buy their amplifier. Be sure you fully understand your obligations. I have owned the Rebel Amp for about six months. In that time, it has worked flawlessly. The amplifier is fairly neutral. It is well built. It has a unique design. It is simple. And clearly, it is made by someone who is passionate about the hobby. Compare the amplifier to other well-known alternatives. The Shit Magni, Rupert Neve headphone amplifier, and the iFi Zen can all offer something unique. The Magni provides incredible power at a cheap price. The RNHP provides sturdy, reliable build with professional-grade components. The Zen Can has balanced input and output and generous power at an affordable price. And all of these amplifiers are cheaper than the Rebel Amp. What is it that makes the Rebel Amp worth $500? Perhaps you could say that the overall design and hand-built nature is a selling point. Well, I'm sure some people will find that convincing. Maybe someone will comment that the Rebel Amp uses audiophile grade components and that justifies its price tag. And some might argue that the Rebel Amp's overall design, its Class A circuitry combined with its built-in simplicity, warrants $500. I, however, am not convinced. This brings us to value. No, I do not think the Rebel Amp is worth $500. 
I have to admit, this amplifier has a soft place in my heart. Its design and simplicity are attractive, but there is no objective reason this amplifier should cost $500. Clearly, the amp is underpowered compared to the Magni. For about one-fifth the price of the Rebel amp, the Magni provides more power and just as sturdy build. It's a smaller package as well. The sound signature is hard to distinguish between these two products. Yes, the Magni is an AB design instead of a Class A, but the difference in circuitry has no material effect on performance with headphones. The iFi Zencan offers a slightly different sound signature, but for $150, you get a Class A circuitry, balanced connection, and more power than the Rebel Amp. The overall feature set of the Zencan simply trounces the Rebel Amp. Also consider the Rupert Neve headphone amplifier. This is the same price as the Rebel Amp, but a smaller package. The RNHP has much less power at its disposal, but it also uses top-of-the-line circuitry. I can easily conclude that the Magni and Zencan have value. It is hard for me to find value in the RNHP and Rebel Amp. Both the RNHP and Rebel Amp are luxury products. Neither does anything particularly innovative. Neither amplifier has any objective reason to cost what they cost. But, just as with the RNHP, the Rebel Amp does not have any faults. The Rebel Amp works without hassle and seems to be well built. Nevertheless, $500 is a lot of money. I simply cannot find a reason to recommend the Rebel Amp at this price. If you have $500 burning a hole in your pocket, then you may get plenty of enjoyment from this amplifier. If you are already convinced that you want to buy this product, then I cannot think of any reason why you should not. But anyone who is budget conscious, anybody who can easily think of better use of $500, to you I say the following you can put $500 to better use than on the Rebel Amp. Rebel Audio's goal to use quality components in their amplifier is commendable, but I don't think it is enough justification for the price. There are plenty of good amplifiers with good components. Just because some audiophiles think that the components in the Rebel Amp are superior to the Shit Magni or Zencan or RNHP does not mean that the Rebel Amp is in fact superior. And that is my bottom line. Despite Rebel Audio's claims and some reviews by audiophiles, I do not think the Rebel Amp is superior in any way to the competition, nor do I think it is affordable. The Rebel Amp is a good product that does exactly what it should. The problem is that it offers little to explain its cost. And when you consider Rebel Audio's refund and warranty policies, I'm more skeptical of this amplifier's value proposition. I don't think this is a bad product. In fact, it is a good one. But when money is tight and competition is stiff, merely being good is not, well, good enough. You have to excel in things that matter. If the Rebel Amp was $100 or $200 cheaper, my position would be different. But as it stands, the Rebel Amp's price tag is too hefty and its overall performance too similar when compared against cheaper products. It won't be a mistake if you buy it, but you're not really missing out on anything if you don't.